From UBS Wealth Management, Ketan Samani joins us. Welcome to CCW Digital on B2B IQ. I'm your host, Seth Adler. Download episodes on ccwdigital.com or through our app in iTunes within the iTunes podcast app in Google Play or wherever you currently get your podcasts. First, some supporters to thank, and then Ketan Samani. Here it is, the fully integrated Cloud CX platform that you need to act smarter, respond faster, and be first in CX. Now you can turn innovation into value, scale up when you need, and add new capabilities whenever the situation demands it. One experience, a single unified solution for employees and customers. One cloud, a single cloud offering based on AWS public cloud technology. One path for migration to the CX1 platform. The fully integrated cloud customer experience platform from NICE, allowing you to be first in CX. Visit NICE.com for more. Leaders responsible for operations, information technology, customer experience, contact centers, customer care, service and support are invited to register for a free CCW digital membership. Membership includes networking with 100,000 plus qualified industry professionals, quarterly executive research reports, product matchmaking, and more. Go to ccwdigital.com to join the community. That's ccwdigital.com. Katan Samani, I work for UBS Wealth Management Asia Pacific. I work here as a chief digital officer uh, with a scope of uh, delivering innovation, uh, developing digital capabilities, and monetizing digital uh, channels. It's a big job. Yes. <laughs> and you've identified what you what it is you're doing. I guess, how are you doing that? You know, the CDO for UBS, you know, what, what do you care about? So there are two things. I think uh, when I look at uh, digitization and the ecosystem that is developing, from a consumer's perspective, um, they're looking that new organization I work with or I need their services care for me. Mm -hmm. Do they have an uh, ethos of investing in relationship with me? Now, wealth management business like UBS is all around relationship. You can have very large uh, client with a few billion dollars, and they act like corporation. Mm -hmm. They have lawyers, they have accountants, and they want that personalized touch to the point at which somebody who just wants to give us one or two million dollars to invest, and they're also looking for a personal touch. So the spectrum of sophistication of our clients are many. So in that, one of my biggest challenges is how do I build a team of people that helps to build a value chain, not silos, to focus on client experience from both digital and non-digital. So when there is non-digital, it's all around cultural transformation of staff mm -hmm. in pushing the boundaries with systemically in order to derive at um, focus on client needs. Digitally, it's much more data-driven around we look at behavior, data analytics, to see how we can co correlate between offline and online client experience consistency. As a private bank, clients are paying us a lot of money to get that client experience. Yeah. And UBS being the world's previous premier bank has to demonstrate that. And if you look at our marketing events and our client education events, uh, we stretch our goals not only to serve the client who's paying us fees, but the children, the next generation who may inherit this big, uh, uh, big responsibility to preserve the wealth for the family, uh, to pass it on to the next generation. Mm. And we look to educate them uh, on, on how they should do that. It sounds as though, so as you talk about your clients, how they think, it seems like a very kind of luxury goods ethos almost, both from the product, the service, and the customer, the, the experience itself. Everything kind of revolves around quality. Correct. Quality of advice, to be precise. Um, advice can only be given when we spend enormous amount of time and effort in the right way to get to know our clients. Um, every other bank can provide wealth management service today, whether it's regional or international. What differentiates a bank is how much energy and quality of people and services that you put in front of the client to understand the complexity and emotional need of the consumer. Mm -hmm. To me, that is really important. In the banking world 20 years ago, 
I don't think emotional need of a consumer was amplified today mm -hmm. because of digital, because of social media, amplification of emotional need is very high. Between a mass market means the people who don't have a million dollars, but the ones who do, the emotional needs are not that different because they're both humans. Mm -hmm. And that common denominator needs to be understood that the more wealthy you are, the more complexity you have. And more complexity is understood by the bankers. We provide better services by that knowledge. Yeah. Complexity of emotion, though, what are we getting at there? What do we mean? So there is um, complexity for the need of my business to grow, mm -hmm. complexity of my family to have the preservation if I'm gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I have a need to give back to society. I want to do a bill of philanthropy. I made it now. I need to give back. Um, I have uh, houses in five different countries, businesses in 10 different countries. My children are studying in different uh, countries. To manage all that financially, emotionally, an assistant is required. Mm. And often advice is required. If you look at it globally, the regulation and rules of money management changes around 50 to 60,000 rules a year. Mm -hmm. So if you look at per day in the, you know, 280 or days left uh, in a year to work, mm -hmm. that's a lot of rule changes. Consumer cannot keep up with it. That's why they hire us to say, how do you interpret? How can you serve me? How can I make sure I stay on the right side of the law? Yeah. And how do I make sure to stay on the right side of the law? It comes down to that, doesn't it? it? People, don't, people make mistakes um, because they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Our job is to be in the know so that we can advise them. That's why they buy our service. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, you know, that many regulation changes per day if we're looking at the globe. I would imagine that's where uh, at least one place where innovation comes in. You mentioned that you're, you know, looking over innovation. What's most important in terms of that gargantuan word? Anticipating need. Mm -hmm. Making it easier for humans to perform that job, whether you're a client or whether you are a staff of UBS. For us, knowing that that many regulatory changes happening, how do I allow access to these changes and implications which are summarized by our control functions, compliance, regulation, risk teams to the very people who are going to meet clients. Mm -hmm. That's kind of very important. The other important is, is the investment instruments are complex. So many, so many markets. How do I bring structured information back to the front line so that when they meet client, they can satisfy the need of the consumer? Mm -hmm. Not every time, our client advisors or relationship managers can find answers. And we are quite okay to tell our, our clients that your need is so acute and different. We may not have it. Could you give us time to research mm. and we'll come back to you? We've understood the problem. We understood your challenges. Let us come back to you. Is it because of the trust that you've engendered in that relationship that they allow you that time? Absolutely. Um, and we are result oriented. Client experience is about can we deliver and how we deliver and do we go beyond the delivery ask for us? Could we anticipate the next step for mm -hmm. the kind of client? As clients trying to resolve a problem, it's anticipating once that uh, problem is resolved, what will they think next? Mm -hmm. UBS employs probably one of the best in-class quality staff around the world. We are number one. We attract best-in-class talent and we apply this talent both on a digital front as well as on physical front. Hmm. As far as uh, the customer's experience, it begins with the employee's experience. You mentioned you have the best and brightest. What are you looking for? How do you ensure that you uh, continue to have the best and brightest? Uh, it's around um, creating internal cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so as I mentioned around, we think about and anticipate need of our staff. Uh, my job is to constantly curate problem statement and use cases in a technical terms from various functional heads in the bank. Look to provide digital solution where they have not got a physical capability to take on the challenge or resolve the, the problem they have. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately synthesize to ensure that anything we do digitally 
allows them to deliver best in class services. Yeah. So if you are an employee, you'll be better served knowing that you can turn to operations, you can turn to technology, you can turn to digital, you can turn to product for the services. And collectively, we can give them the ammunition to go out there and provide best in class service to to the client. Understood that it's a col- that collective animation. Correct. It's that kind of suite or yes. entourage of, uh, of solutions. Can you give us, you know, uh, choose if you can, a uh, digital solution where there wasn't one before to demonstrate what we're talking about? Now, this is a small example. Yeah. There are plenty sure. I can give you. But for our, for our time and energy, I, I talk about two years, three years ago when Apple Watch came out, a lot of retail banks went out there and uh, and and decided that they need to provide service of payments or alerts on Apple Watch. It was quite interesting to watch that in the wealth management industry in the high end, where I can afford $50,000 watch, best in class wristwatch of 100000 200000 why would I buy a digital electronic watch that mm-hmm. I have to keep charging every night. <laughs> uh, the other one can life, li- uh, you know, go for a lifetime. Right. Um, and it's very interesting challenge that we had. But what was overlooked is a lot of clients bought a digital watch in correlation to a physical watch uh, 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 and they used it for alerts. When you're in meetings, you're important, you're traveling, uh, anything that's happening to your finance, it'd be great to see it at a glance. And then it it keeps privacy. Mm -hmm. It was an enormous step forward to be able to do that as a first in the industry for us and to uh, and to allow clients to get the alerts on if they if they wanted to know what's happening in the market if they want, what's happening with the money if they had to uh, the relationship wanted a uh, manager wanted a decision from them mm-hmm. it's easy to just respond with a two line uh, a text uh, and it, it proved to be very good client experience for us one that you wouldn't expect that your client would want based on the fact that they have what they already have Correct. or can get yes. what they already want. Correct. What, what's interesting is that, of course, goes back to the uh, to Steve Jobs' uh, mindset of, well, you know, yeah, that's a phone. Let me show you the iPhone. It's a completely new and different thing. Correct. So as far as providing that, that anticipatory on one side, but also uh, providing a product or service that the uh, customer doesn't know that they want – you mentioned, you know, thinking ahead or thinking one step ahead of the the customer. What about providing what they might not necessarily know that they want? Um, this is uh, the technique where our relationship managers gather in our CRM system, where they look at hobbies, uh, the future plans of our clients. And then there are teams who sit together to strategize, what can we do to support our clients? So it doesn't have to be transactional in nature for finance. But if a client is thinking about buying a company, it's not something they're going to give us the funds and the management for, even mm-hmm. though they've got cash to buy a company. But they may need to have a good understanding of the risk. If they're buying a, a, a company in a specific country, the geopolitical risk, uh, the currency risk, uh, the risk of talent in that country. If they're then going to trade with that company to another locations, what's the cross-border issues are like? So we can provide knowledge. This is, uh, that's the commercial side. Mm-hmm. Personal side, a lot of clients worry about, will my son or my daughter will ever take over what I've built? And that's a worry. It's a worry that is of very private nature. And we open up to show them the opportunities. We've got UBS University in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and in China, and obviously in Switzerland too, and elsewhere in the world. And these these institutions were built internally to design to provide framework for our clients to send their second and third generation kids there as they get into their te- late teens and, uh, and early uh, uh, part of their um, careers to come and learn about challenges of managing large wealth Mm -hmm. and what is the implication for having such wealth and how how should they protect and preserve that and do better for society. And, you know, this, these sort of education areas are, are designed in conjunction with knowledge that the clients desire that. Mm -hmm. So we go over and beyond what is asked of us to manage money to give that service to our clients. And that's the anticipation of needs. Yeah, certainly. Certainly it is. You mentioned in the session, we're here at Customer Experience Management Asia in Singapore, and 
you mentioned your client base is, did you say 0 0.02? Yes. Or what, what was the stat? So we go for, see, if you look at uh, people who have ability to park on average $10 million plus yeah. wealth with a bank to invest in the market, the net worth will be 50 to 100 million. Okay. To find that kind of population in any country, it's a tiny amount. Sure. Now, you know, in, in any given market in Asia Pacific, there'll be more than 100 banks who want to bank with them. Mm -hmm. right? So to be able to win that business convincingly and to be able to sustainably keep it and deliver value, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. So we are realistic of the proportion of the market share we can go after. And then we are not quantity driven. We are quality driven. And clients trust us because of that. So you're only going after 0.02% of the market purposely. Yes. We can then only sustain the client experience and service we, we, we are really proud to provide. So by definition, the other side of this, of course, is by definition, nearly 100% yes. of the folks that are listening yeah. uh, will, will not uh, be kind of servicing uh, your same audience, you know, or maybe they will, but not the same way, of course, right? My question to you then is what advice do you have for your colleagues that don't necessarily, you know, focus on 0.02%, yeah. but do focus on some proportion of that other uh, nearly 100%. What can they do that doesn't necessarily, you know, cost money, that isn't necessarily a UBS wealth solution, you know? I'm so glad you asked me that question. In the last roundtable debate just now before our meeting, mm -hmm. um, I passionately appeal to multiple um, colleagues who come from multiple uh, uh, background and companies to think about omnichannel and client experience from client perspective. Mm -hmm. Today, channel development by any corporation is designed to uh, com uh, to deliver value to the organization. It is out of the pain of the organization the call center is built. It's out of the pain of the organization to serve so many clients, branches are built. It's a pain of the uh, organization to have online built because they do not want to have a call center 24-7. So it's always resolution of having digitization and channel building, um, not for client experience, although that's what the uh, facade tends to be, but realistically, it's resolving the uh, the organizational problem. Mm -hmm. The day when the organizations really take time to anticipate need of the consumer and then design the uh, the channels around clients. So the example I gave in the panel was around a sixty year old Singaporean widow investing in the market, large sums of money of what she is inherited from a family. Um, was quite insightful individual in designing an advisory digital solution that would benefit thousands of customers by us mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. But that insight, listening, bringing it back into the organization, building that service layer, and then continuously monitoring the client satisfaction is very important. Continuously monitoring. We, Correct. We love to fall down on that one, right? We love to forget <laughs> that one. Yes. And, you know, the all the scoring and benchmarking that goes on, in my opinion, should be taken in in balance to the continuous evolution of client needs. Mm -hmm. As we age, our need of services of all kinds, doesn't have to be bank, changes. So I would tell my colleagues, get down to likes of ethnographic research, not groups, you know, focus groups. Focus groups has its part in marketing research, but having eyeball to eyeball with a consumer living the pain they go through and then dissecting that pain and understanding how you could improve client experience is the worth exercise mm. I, I encourage. And in my career, the best results and the best trophies I've, my team has uh, received is because when we collectively focus on client experience together and we passionately do this year after year in every country and we track client satisfaction on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And we react to it. We have a reaction uh, process around that. It's real That's, time. It's real time. Yeah. As real time as we can afford it. Yeah, of course. Right. And if anybody can afford No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so so let's, let's go all the way back. You, you've got a little bit of a unique background, right? Where were you born? 
and then where were you raised type of thing, right? Well, uh, I'm fortunate enough to have born in Africa. It's a wonderful continent in this world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and understand the culture and the nature that you, you, you inherit when, you, when you're born there. I've been raised in England, another beautiful country with great diversity and, and a culture of its own. And, and I enjoyed growing up there. And I live in uh, Asia Pacific for the last 10 years, enjoying the diversity and culture here. So I'm a truly international citizen. Yeah, certainly. And, and I wonder... You know, uh, I want to go through kind of your, maybe a few of your positions aside from the UBS position, although how long have you been there? Three years now. Just three years? Yes. Okay. Um, Can you compare in one sentence Africa, then Europe, we'll count uh, the UK in Europe because when you were living there, uh, it was in Europe. Yes. That's a Brexit joke. (laughs) And then I exited uh, early. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You exited before they did. That's right. Um, and then maybe Singapore and, and kind of Southeast Asia. W- one sentence on each, you know, kind of living experience for you. Um, Africa is around nature. You fall in love with nature all over again. You understand the connectivity between the animal kingdom and us humans mm-hmm. and how beautiful and self-sustaining it is uh, if, if you keep it as a human and cherish it. Uh, England. I think it's extremely enriching in terms of uh, culture, its history, and um, I would say my best part of education came from England. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm very privileged to have that opportunity to learn, um, and in the in the English system, we learn a lot of diver- uh, different knowledge and broad European exposure as well. So I've done business in Germany and and in Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then finally, Asia Asia Pacific. I love the culture and the kind aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, the diversity that you find in Southeast Asia uh, is so rich and people are so kind. And then finally, my favorite subject, food. Uh, <laughs> a variety of food here. So it is brilliant. I went to uh, the, the Newton uh, Hawker yes. uh, area. Oh, so good. That's just amazing. It's value as well, as well as good food. Of right? course, yeah. We just kept on getting dishes and it was... Oh. All of it was good, and, yes. and I've had nearly none of it before <laughs> getting here. You mentioned, uh, you know, education in England. W- where did you go to university? City in mm-hmm. London. Okay. So, what did you study? I did management. Okay. Uh, and then, what did you come out, and what was your kind of first job type of thing? Interestingly, I managed uh, contact centers for Midland Bank, which is now HSBC. Uh Uh, That was my first job. But before that, I was a motor mechanic. So I built cars and repair cars and I was in garage. I'm a qualified mechanic. Get out of here. Yeah, I really enjoy uh, What is your favorite car, I wonder? Uh, Honestly, I like reliability. Uh So I love uh, Toyotas, which is not a a thing people would say, you know, Ferrari or all that. Not a car guy. (laughs) Not not that way, car guy. But I prefer that. uh, Again, I'm saying. Experience. Car guy would not usually say Toyota. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, I feel the reliability. People like going A to B without a hassle. Mm-hmm. And I find mm-hmm. some of the Japanese cars and German cars outside. I love Mercedes. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of an old man's car, I know. But yeah. I really feel that those cars give you the ultimate comfort and beautiful drive. I'm not a racing driver, so I don't look for fast cars, but I look for cars that give you really good comfort. So essentially going from A to B without a single F. Absolutely. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> All right. So this auto mechanic thing, I wouldn't have known it. Um, but And then managing the contact center, which gets us uh, into your thinking as far as th- that being, uh, you know, a solution for something that was broken, right? So let me talk about client experience in contact center context. What I really enjoyed is sharpening up my hearing senses. Hmm. When you work in a contact center for two years, three years, four years, and you're listening to the consumer talking about the financial challenges, they've lost a card or they were this problem or that problem, you can actually feel the emotions through your ears. And that is really, if you can understand other person's anxiety and challenges, and you are able to resolve it and you feel the relief they feel at the other end, um, it's a very beautiful experience. Indeed. It sets you up around client experience in a different way. Yeah. I uh, have a, a terrible habit now when I get in touch with a contact center um, and I hear the other person not being empathetic to me, I, I just point it out. I say, you realize you're just not being empathetic. And sometimes they pick up and say, oh, oh, sorry, excuse me, you know, and 
but uh, many times conscientious people do pick it up yeah they realize they're getting into the job as is something they have to do mm. but i think most and majority of the people when they understand the problem they're quite anxious to resolve it yeah. uh, in any given context center and i think this is one of the cultural transformation because every business nowadays large enough employ some kind of automation or ability to serve masses mm-hmm. and context center tends to be part of it and i can't wait to see the day when um bots and rpa uh, uh, technologies and artificial intelligence do a much better th- job than us as humans can we get tired yeah. doing this repetitive task while the machine won't how much can you get into what you might be doing at ubs in that area we already are uh, we've been doing experimentation for the last 3 years a mm. uh, couple of years now we're looking at automation in multiple ways i'll give you an idea uh, we realized that uh, an audit challenge came to us to look at eight quarters worth of backdated pdf documents to see if there was an anomaly in the data um and this was a direct uh, challenge by the regulators on their audit um to do that within a 30 days time frame uh, as we should be on top of our work mm-hmm. would have taken army of people um because you're looking at millions of documents so it's like looking for needle in a haystack mm. we turned to one of the fintechs to see if they had the algorithms to auto read pdf documents in a specific frame rules that we know how we produce those documents and to siphon through those documents uh, at a faster speed few thousands a second and find the anomaly and it did in 2 weeks so um uh, you know this is the kind of thing we are, are trying to resolve in the banks i said there's there's an example for you certainly and now we've automated the entire program in a thumb drive mm-hmm. and given it to the business so you can use it as many times as you want now if we did go to a large tech company to do this it would have cost me huge amount of money this was few thousand us yeah that's amazing that's amazing considering the times the time saved considering the uh amount of work you know the the amount of human resources that you wouldn't that you didn't have to use so that's the business sense mm-hmm. the consumer sense so my team looking at our stakeholders internally as internal clients mm-hmm. and their satisfaction and trust towards us has increased so we look to foster that trust that the digital team is not here to replace any human employees but we are looking to replace your problems right. with opportunities ooh we're looking to replace your problems with opportunities is that already the tagline because i feel like we should tell the marketing folks <laughs> i mean that's good <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so i uh, i've got three final questions for you sure. i'll tell you what they are and then i'll ask you them in order sure what has most surprised you at work along the way we talked only a little bit really about your career what's most surprised you in life and then on the soundtrack of your life one track one song that's got to be on there but first things first along the way what what's most surprised you at work um commitment of people mm. once they're convinced and that convincing convincing part is really challenging sure when you're building teams which I've done several times in my life but once you do and they convince the followership towards towards scientifically trying to crack the, the 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 issues and digitization initially becomes a threat to a lot of internal staff mm-hmm. they're going to take our jobs they're going to automate this they're going to automate that but you know i give very fundamental and basic example at work say how many divisional heads we know are looking for more budget and more resources because every year the target increases so you naturally need to have a bigger workforce mm-hmm. it's close to impossible to sustain that as a cost base right so digital is here to replace the challenges that you have in order to achieve your targets and objectives use it well mm-hmm. that's it yeah that has created a very positive feel in the business is it that digitization solves past problems in other words automate the stuff that we already know how to do so that we can focus on the stuff that we aren't doing yet correct correct because i think humans are very creative mm-hmm. given the opportunity given the circumstances we are very creative uh both in positive sense and negative sense and i guess sure. that if there is a consistent problem uh, on a shoulder of a human being trying to deliver something they could become negative Mm. creative as well mm-hmm. so i think uh, a digitization can help them do their job better and therefore the positive creativity could be fostered uh and 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 uh, environment could be created where they and we use a very standard thing now in the industry or at least i think is becoming a standard of human centered design mm-hmm. so we offer opportunity for them to get out of the desk for two days intensively in a boot camp and 
work out a creative solution behind the problem they think they have. And we facilitate. We don't tell them how to do it. We simply give them the tools of how they can think, how they can apply the techniques to resolve their own problem. So we empower them. And that's been a very powerful technique. Yeah. Think about thinking almost, right? Yes. Yeah. And and it's um, simplifying. Uh, I think a lot of people worry about getting too close to a problem and see the complexity and dimensions of the challenges they have and consider it's complex. But if you step back far enough and look at the problem closely with multiple disciplinary people around you, they can help you simplify it. Mm. That's very well said. Thank you. What's most surprised you in life? Um, Being a parent. (laughs) (laughs) I never thought I could be a father uh, and a good husband. And I'm proud to say that my wife, who is extremely supportive and a great artist, um, makes um, makes our family great. I don't think I don't think I could do this without her, and uh, I don't think I would have a career without her. Right. I, I'd I'd say that uh, that surprised me. I never was ready as uh-huh. a boy. I was never ready for marriage. I was never ready for parenthood. I was never ready for uh, challenges in life, and I think that surprised me a lot. Okay. Well, I mean, I, what I think one of the keys with the wife right, is there's really only one word that you need to know. Do you know what that word is? Um, thank you, or I love you. <laughs> and before that, yes. Yes, yeah, right. it's always a yes. That's for sure. <laughs> Boys never grow up. <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. We are behind the whole time. Yes, that's exactly right. Absolutely. We, we discovered that late in life, <laughs> yeah. I would say. That's, that's exactly right. All right, so on the soundtrack of your life, one track, one song that's got to be on there. Um, I like uh, uh, Baby Your Firework by um, uh, the American artist. I know it still in the escapes me. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> Is it a male or female? Female. Oh. Uh, she's, uh, she's quite... Uh, new or no, in new, the fairly past? New, fairly new. Fairly new. Yeah. Uh, my, my daughter sings that all the time. Oh, okay. So Baby Your Firework. Oh, uh, I know. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's so, one of the big ones. It's, yes. I, yes. And forgive it's me. It's not Ariana Grande. It's the other one. Yeah. Um, Damn, I, it should come back to me. Anyway, because my daughters uh, listen to music a lot, and I like to um, listen to them singing sure. uh, the, the, the song. So they, it's going to pick it up. And I feel that it's really, really nicely sung uh, song, and the, and the girls love it, so I love it too. And I'm sure that anyone listening right now is laughing at us that we can't come up with the <laughs> artist's name, but that's neither here You'll nor there. You'll probably come out of the interview, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, Thank you for considering me for the interview. Of course. And there you have Keitan Samani. Very much appreciate Keitan truly giving us an understanding of how it all works at UBS Wealth Management and what the customer experience truly means there. So very much appreciate his time. Very much appreciate yours. Stay tuned.